This is the Residence Lecture Series, which will be lectures to periodontal residents as well as general practice residents in GPRs or AEGDs. Resident Lecture Number One. The topics that will be covered on this first lecture include developing a treatment philosophy, which is three and a half minutes. Number two, developing a treatment-focused diagnosis, which is 12 minutes long, and hence on teaching effective tooth brushing, which is seven minutes, and variations in flossing techniques in the healthy mouth as compared to the unhealthy mouth, nine and a half minutes. In essence, this whole webinar on the first lecture will take about 30 minutes. However, we will pause, answer questions and all, and it can very comfortably be presented at a luncheon so as not to take any clinical time away from the residents. The importance of developing a treatment philosophy. There are two steps in developing your philosophy. The first is to find success as you see it for yourself. For you as a young person, define success differently than I do as an older person. And second, develop your own personal mission statement. So let's talk about success. Now, let's look at how I define success in my life. I have raised two children who are financially successful and spiritually sound. I have three grandchildren. I must let their parents raise them and not offer unsolicited advice. I have achieved financial success in security, so I do not define success in financial terms. Therefore, I measure success by my legacy. I would hope that the inscription on my tombstone would read, he made a difference. In the time that I have left, my goal is to make as positive an impact on my fellow man as I possibly can. Now let's talk about mission statements. Now, when I started in my periodontal practice in 1969, there was no such thing as a mission statement. That came along later, probably in the late 80s or early 90s. But if I had a mission statement, this is basically what it would be. I will offer the patient the opportunity to treat every functional tooth, regardless of the severity of the periodontal disease. And this became the basis for the Miller-McIntyre Periodontal Prognostic Index, or the MMPPI. When I retired in 2008, my mission statement changed as I became an academician and not a clinician. My mission statement at that point read, I'm an educator first and a clinician second. My primary responsibility is to teach my students to think, and I wanna emphasize that, to think, and offer treatment options. Third, I will teach students to provide adequate information so that the patient can select the treatment option that best suits their needs. I think this quote from my web textbook sums it up quite nicely. A treatment plan is a journey subject to change when the circumstances change. It requires flexibility on the part of a conscientious and caring dentist, as well as a trusting patient. My first mission statement was that of a clinician. My second mission statement was that of an academician. And now my mission statement is that of a mentor rather than a clinician or a academician. So my mission statement now is, I will be a mentor rather than a teacher. I will be an encourager. I will provide positive guidance. I will listen to you. And finally, I will be your friend. For as Walter Winchell says, a friend is someone who walks in when everyone else walks out. A friend will not lie to you. A friend will not play games with you. And that's what a friend is all about. I think T.S. Niles summed it up quite well when he said, I'm just one beggar trying to show other beggars where to find bread. In treating dental students, I found that what was in the didactic lectures did not translate well into the clinic. 
So therefore, I developed what I referred to as a treatment-focused diagnosis, or a TFD. The first thing we need to look at is what should be included in a periodontal examination or treatment plan. First, we need to know the clinical signs of periodontal disease, the predisposing or etiologic factors, what is the diagnosis, what is the prognosis, and what are the treatment options. Here we have six blocks dealing with various aspects of the examination. It's not the purpose of this tape to go over all of the clinical signs of periodontal disease or the predisposing factors. We're going to focus on box three and four, which focus on a quantitative way of determining bleeding on probing and what I refer to as the treatment-focused diagnosis. Like blocks one and two, the focus of this tape is not on blocks five and six. Five and six, to me, is self-explanatory exactly what you do for health, what you do for gingivitis, and what you do for periodontitis in your treatment plan. Block number six, I think, is rather unique. For all patients are interested in improving the quality of their breath. And by looking at two videos on the web textbook, one of them is on the least expensive, most effective mouthwash, and the other is on the importance of cleaning the tongue. The importance of cleaning the tongue, you should be aware that after you do a good job of brushing and flossing, 90% of the bacteria left in the mouth are on the posterior third of the tongue. This cannot be brushed without gagging, and if this material is not removed back there, not only do you have excessive numbers of bacteria left, but you also have sulfur-forming bacteria which attribute to bad breath. Students' responses when asked the question, what is the periodontal diagnosis? Again, translating what they get in didactic lectures and what they do in the clinic was not clear to the students. A hundred students were randomly asked, what is the periodontal diagnosis? 45% said bone loss. 10% said calculus. 30% said plaque. 15%, only 15% said gingivitis or periodontitis. So let's see how we attempted to teach them what they did not learn in their didactic lecture. Let's look at the student treatment options on the average patient coming through the periodontal treatment. Whether the patient was healthy or diseased, when asked what the treatment was going to be, 100% of the students said scaling and root planing they didn't seem to understand when scaling was indicated or when root planing was indicated. And when asked if there was bleeding on probing, all students said their patients had bleeding on probing, when in reality, many did not. So determining a treatment-focused diagnosis, number four, we have health, and health is basically no bleeding on probing, no suppuration and no pockets. This patient simply needs the treatment of what's often referred to as a prophy, removal of supergingival plaque and calculus, and reinforce home care if necessary. Much discussion went on with various faculty members in dealing with health with attachment loss. This is a patient that has generalized recession interdentally as well as facially, and generally this is a result of periodontal surgery. There's no bleeding on probing, there's no suppuration, and there are no pockets. So what we're dealing with a treatment on this, this is the same as a healthy mouth. And basically, even though there's attachment loss, we're gonna just do a prophy on this particular patient. The dilemma, what if we have superficial redness, bleeding, in areas of recession, but have no probing depth. What is the diagnosis? Basically, this looks like a gingivitis, but when we have attachment loss, the true diagnosis on that is a periodontitis. Gingivitis. We're all familiar that there should be some bleeding on probing. Pockets are present from swollen tissue, but not from attachment loss. And the treatment is scaling and polishing 
if slight to moderate. If you have a severe gingivitis, perhaps you may want to do a gross debridement, reinforce home care, and follow that up with scaling and polishing. But this is not treated by scaling and root planing, only by scaling. And oral hygiene instruction certainly is necessary as well as a follow-up reevaluation. Treatment-focused diagnosis. Let's now go to patient number one. This patient has a slight gen generalized periodontitis. The treatment, scaling of the entire mouth, oral hygiene instruction, and reevaluation. Very clear to the student exactly what they need to do. They're not going to be doing any root planing. There is no attachment loss. So we scale the entire mouth. We do no root planing, oral hygiene instruction, and reevaluation. So, gingivitis, generalized, slight to moderate. That is the treatment diagnosis, and the students are encouraged to circle this on the sheet that they are given. Patient number two has a localized uh, gingivitis. Now, what does that tell us? We're not going to be doing any root planing. The rest of the mouth, other than the lower anterior, is healthy, and the scaling is going to be focused on the lower anteriors, and the rest of the mouth would be treated as a healthy mouth, and a prophy would be done. Patient number three. Patient number three has a periodontitis. It's localized and it is slight, and it is in the maxillary molar areas. What does that say? The mouth is healthy except for a localized periodontitis where there is attachment loss. We also know that this is a case that is not going to require surgery, that the treatment can be completed with root planing, and we need to obviously follow up, reevaluate, reevaluate, and reinforce home care. Patient number four. Patient number four has a generalized slight periodontitis. So therefore, root planing is going to be done throughout the mouth. Patient number five. Patient number five has a generalized moderate uh, periodontitis. We do not know in this particular case whether surgery is going to be necessary, but we know we're going to do initial preparation and basically with a generalized periodontitis, we are going to scale and root plane the entire mouth. Patient number six. Patient number six has a generalized severe periodontitis. Yes, we're going to do initial preparation and in all probability, the patient is going to need surgery. And this is a patient that perhaps should be referred to the periodontist. So now the student begins to get an idea exactly what they're looking at and how to deal with it. Now let's look at patient number seven. This is a typical patient in a general practice office who has periodontal disease and from the treatment focused diagnosis, the treatment would be completed there. The patient would not be referred to the periodontist. The patient has a generalized gingivitis. What does that tell us? That we're going to scale the entire mouth. But the patient also has a localized slight periodontitis in the maxillary molar areas. So this is an area where we're going to do some root planing. And we're going to give oral hygiene instructions. We're going to come back and reevaluate. But with a slight periodontitis, this is going to respond nicely to root planing without any surgical intervention. What about bleeding on probing? We want to quantitate bleeding on probing. Slight bleeding on probing is a trace. It's delayed. It means there's minimal inflammation and therefore not very significant. A typical on this would be on the mandibular left, you probe tooth number 18, you see no bleeding on probing. You probe tooth number 19, you see no bleeding on probing. But when you get to tooth number 20, maybe on I. 18 or 19, a little blood has oozed out. Really not significant, but we do need to be aware that there was some bleeding on probing. Moderate bleeding on probing is spontaneous, and it means there's a greater inflammatory response and a more significant clinical finding. In this case, let's say that you place the probe in a pocket 
and it measures five millimeters and you withdraw the probe and as the probe is withdrawn, blood follows that out. Severe bleeding on probing is profuse and persistent and means there's a greater level of inflammatory response. In this case, typically the tissue is somewhat swollen, reddened, and as you begin to probe, before you even reach the depth of the pocket, blood oozes out. So this is a good way for students to learn a quantitative way of doing bleeding on probing. Now let's summarize what I hope you've learned. We've got six factors on this flow sheet. The first two factors, the clinical signs of disease and the etiologic factors we did not discuss. Our focus was on number three and number four, quantitating bleeding on probing in the treatment focused diagnosis. On the bottom, five and six, we must touch on slightly. The treatment options are quite obvious. Let's focus on number six, treatment for bad breath. This is something all patients are interested in and very little is addressed in this area in most dental clinics. So to be effective on treating bad breath, halitosis, malodor, or whatever you prefer, please go to the web textbook and look at the least expensive, most effective mouthwash, one video, as well as the video on the importance of cleaning your tongue because most bacteria associated with bad breath are on the posterior third of the tongue. It is my hope that if you will incorporate this in undergraduate teaching in your dental school, if you're a teacher, you will find the students will have not only a much better understanding of what they're trying to accomplish, but will also have a greater appreciation for periodontal therapy. Let me give you some thoughts on teaching effective brushing. These thoughts, in my opinion, will help the patient to understand what they're trying to accomplish and make brushing more effective. Number two, it will help them prevent recession and the subsequent root abrasion that occurs long term. Let's talk about a couple of the biggest mistakes in ordinary brushing. The first is using too much toothpaste. The toothpaste companies would like to see you cover up all the bristles as we've done here. And that's way too much toothpaste. You can see on the right, a little dollop of paste, or in this case, a gel, and that's all that's necessary. For if you use all that toothpaste on the left, you will create so much foam and bubbles that you'll have to purse the lips and you'll be unable to brush the facial or the upper molars, especially the second molar or the distal. And the thing that I found that you probably haven't thought about is when you start using a toothbrush and start stimulating the mouth, it creates a significant amount of saliva. So if you have all of that paste on the left and all of that saliva that you're creating, you've got the lips, as I said, so pursed that you can't lift up the zygomatic arch and you really will not be able to brush the posterior part of the mouth. So one of the things that I do in my mouth is after I initial do my brushing with the paste on the right is to empty out all of that excessive saliva that I have created and then make one more turn getting behind the upper molars and on the facial of those teeth. And as I've pointed out, you can see that we're using a gel here rather than toothpaste. Many years ago, there was a study done, but I cannot find what it was, but using extracted teeth and a mechanical arm, which brushed them thousands of times, they found that by using a toothpaste, they were still able to create uh, abrasion on the root, but if they used a gel, the abrasion was much less. So that's the reason I suggest a gel rather than a paste to prevent root abrasion. So making brushing more effective, preventing recession and root uh, abrasion. I'm pointing out you want to use a gel rather than a paste. And one of the things I think we need to distinguish between is what is cervical erosion and what is cervical corrosion. Now, 
what we're doing when we use water in just on a toothbrush and not a paste, then we're creating erosion. But once you add a chemical to that, and let's face it, toothpaste or tooth gel is a chemical, we're creating some level of corro corrosion. And certainly when we talk about GERD and acid regurgitation, that certainly is corrosion on that. Making a tube of tooth gel lasts longer. Here's a used up tube of tooth gel ready to be thrown away. However, if you will take and suck on that a little bit, you can get a dollop of tooth gel on there adequate for brushing. And I have found by doing this, I can get an extra two to three weeks of use out of what ordinarily would be a used up tube of tooth gel. There's also an advantage to this. For what is one of the things that husbands and wives argue about? Someone failing to put the top on the toothpaste, not squeezing it right. So what I advocate is each member of the family should have their own tube of tooth gel. So therefore, they can suck the tooth gel out of it, make it last longer, and avoid that family argument. Toothbrush design. Here are two vastly different toothbrush designs, both made by the same company. I don't think toothbrush design makes a whole lot of difference as long as it's a soft brush. And there's no problem now finding soft brushes. And I make a comment about mechanical or battery operated devices, toothbrushes. These are fine. Um, I have always used a brush and am very good at using the brush. Don't use too much tooth gel. Empty out the excessive saliva and I can do a very adequate job with using a hand brush. Now let's go to the video where I can point out these things to you live. You've just watched the presentation on more effective toothbrushing, and now I'd like to demonstrate some of the things that we talked about on there. Remember, don't sit down and squeeze all of this toothbrush paste on there. Because let me watch, let me show you what happens when you do that. I'm trying to hold all those suds in there and look what's happening to my cheeks. I'm holding those so close together. So what you want to do you only want to cover up just with a dollop the bristles only. Look how little tooth the gel I have. Now look when I brush I'm not holding all those suds in there. And notice that I'm using a rotary motion. The teeth are close together. Notice I don't have any trouble holding the suds in there. And I put the teeth together and look what's happened to the zygomatic arch. I can look up underneath there and I can get behind that tooth. And I use sort of a rotary muscle motion to do that. When I come across the front, I change. I come back here, but look how easy it is for me to talk. I can come down, either on the lower left, switch. But now look how much saliva that I created just from stimulating the mouth. And there's still plenty of paste in there to go on the second pass around the teeth. So let's start on the top right this time. Notice how well I can do those upper molars. Switch. Behind. Switch. And we're basically through. Now, when you're brushing, tell the patients to visualize what they're doing initially. Because sitting 
what we do is we're trying to show a patient how to brush. They're holding up the mirror and that's like backing a trailer. You don't look in the mirror when you brush your teeth. You're thinking about what you need to do for the day. Your brushing habit is down. Go ahead and show the patient how to develop a better brushing habit. Again, putting the teeth almost together, lifting up the cheek to get on the distal of these. You'll do a good job of brushing and I hope that this will help you. Having practiced dentistry or taught for nearly 55 years, I've heard all the reasons that patients can give for not flossing. And other than being just simply lazy and refusing to do it, here are the four things that seem consistent in talking with patients who don't floss. The excuses that they give are, my fingers are too big to get in my mouth, my teeth are too close together, it makes my gums bleed, and it hurts. Now let's talk about flossing an unhealthy mouth compared with flossing a healthy mouth. And quite frankly, these are entirely different. Common flossing mistakes. There are four of these. Using too short a piece of floss, the inability to properly place the floss, trying to floss using two fingers, and that really confuses the patient, and long-term consequences of improper flossing, which I will demonstrate what happened in my mouth. My fingers are too big to get in my mouth. Notice how the patient, in this case me, has not wrapped the floss around the index fingers, and therefore there is no way to get the floss in my mouth. Here is a solution. First, wrap the floss around the middle fingers. The distance between the fingers should be approximately one inch. And here we see wrapping it around the middle fingers, but we're not done wrapping. For you still have three or four inches there, and that's still too wide, and the patient cannot get it in his mouth. Now on the right slide here, we're almost through, and now that distance between the teeth should be about one inch or less as we have indicated here. Using too short a piece of floss. Use a piece of floss that is at least 15 inches long. This gives you plenty of floss to wrap around the index fingers and get the fingers close together so that you can properly floss. And you notice I keep talking about floss. Personally, in, I'm, in my mouth, I prefer dental tape to dental floss. It's a little more difficult to get between the teeth, but the broad area of the tape, I find, is much more efficient. Popping the contact, popping the contact. We've all been told, don't pop the contact, don't pop the contact. In an unhealthy mouth, this causes pain and bleeding, and obviously you don't want to pop the contact in, a, in an unhealthy mouth. However, in a healthy mouth, such as my mouth, I pop the contacts all the time because the tissue is healthy, it doesn't bleed, and it doesn't hurt, and it certainly takes less time. Now, in an unhealthy mouth, notice how I am angling the floss on the facial. It's more apical than it is on the occlusal surface, and what you want to do is to gently saw through the contact and slip the floss beyond the contact before you start flossing. So that's the difference in flossing a healthy mouth versus a unhealthy mouth. Now, wrapping the floss around the tooth. Here we're flossing the mesial surface of the tooth and the distal surface of the adjacent tooth. Notice that we have two fingers. The index finger on the facial is what I refer to as the action finger. And the one on the lingual is what I refer to as dead weight. In other words, you don't floss with two fingers, you only floss with one. And I think this is very confusing to patients because they're trying to work two fingers and certainly don't have them look in a mirror when they're doing it, for that's like backing a trailer. And this is one of the things in the clinic I saw all the time is students holding up a mirror so the patient can see the floss. Flossing is a not a visual thing, it's visualizing what you're doing, visualizing what surface you're on, and 
using the proper finger, but the finger on the lingual is always also the dead weight. Now as we're doing the distal, the canine, not the index, but the thumb is the action finger. And what I want you to notice is how we can slip the floss slightly beneath the crest of the gingiva into the sulcus and get any plaque that's off in the subgingival area. And this is where I got into trouble on my lower right molar number 19 because I kept sawing like this and you're going to see the notch that I created on that tooth. So the thumb on the facial is the active finger and the one on the lingual is the, or the palatal, is the dead weight. All right, I mentioned what I did in my mouth. Here we see my number 19, and you can see where I have cut into the uh, area just apical to the cemental enamel junction by sawing that floss and overdoing it there. Probably took 40 or 50 years maybe to get there, but I began to have some chipping on the occlusal surface and cracking and elected to have an onlay or a three-quarter crown done on that. And here you see the three-quarter crown in place and look at where the margin is, right where it's supposed to be. But this shows you how you can be fooled by x-rays because it looks like I should have had crown lengthening done and before that uh, onlay, onlay was done. However, I had that done about five or six years ago and I'm 80 years old now and there's no way that I'm ever going to get any caries there. I haven't had any active caries in probably 40 years. So this is the onlay that was done by my good friend, Dr. Bill McHarris. Now let's look at the video. You've just seen the slideshow that I did on flossing, showing technique. Now let me briefly show you how that's done in the mouth. Now remember what I said, don't get too short a piece of floss. This is about the right length, about uh, 15 inches. And you want to wrap it around your middle fingers, just like I'm doing here. And wrapping it down and see how close my fingers are. Remember I talk about if you've got it like this, you can't put it in your mouth. So therefore, if you have a healthy mouth, remember what I said, I don't hesitate to pop the contact. But if you've got a diseased mouth, what you want to do is rather than put this in like this, you want to angle it, work it through the contact, and then we're going to be flossing the mesial of this tooth. And notice that this index finger is the active finger, whereas this is a static finger. Notice how I rock where I rock. Then, when we do the mesial, the canine, remember, the thumb is a flossing finger. And we also talked about what I did to my lower right first molar. And I still have trouble flossing that too, because when I go there, I have no problem. I have no problem on the second molar. But I had the damnedest time trying to get on the distal of that first molar. And so this is what I did for years and sawed into that. And I found it easier, as you probably do right there, when I floss, just pull the floss through. Now on the lower anterior, let's demonstrate the difference between popping the contact of a healthy mouth and an unhealthy mouth. Let's assume that I have significant periodontal disease, puffy gums, irritated gums, and I certainly don't want to do that. So what I do is angle it, like I mentioned earlier, work it through, and in this case, in the lower anterior, we're going to just use the two index fingers. This one is going to be the flosser. Now we come over and the thumb, the thumb is a flosser. You can't do both feet. It just, it just doesn't, doesn't work. So therefore, hopefully the things that I've shown you will make a difference. Maybe you can change your, your flossing technique, teach your patients how to do that because interdental cleaning is so very, very important.